Good morning. The Army Cyber Institute exists to be on the Army's innovation think tank. We're established to do three things. To expand the cyber body of knowledge, to build and leverage impactful partnerships, and to develop cyber leaders for our Army. We expand the body of knowledge in two ways. First, through research that our military and civilian faculty members conduct, and second, by partnering with researchers across academia and industry. And more than just forming partnerships with other institutions, the Army Cyber Institute works with leaders across the Army to find the right partnerships with academia and industry, across governmental agencies, and with our international allies. I believe we'll hear today from our panelists about the complexity of the various types of partnerships. And to start, to our, to start our discussion of partnership and research, I'd like to highlight two success stories as a basis for our discussion. A successful partnership is one in which a partner achieves mutually beneficial goals or objectives. Jack Voltaic began in conversations with a major financial institute about partnership models and grew into a public-private experimental exercise with cyber live fire and tabletop exercise components. The exercise resulted in great benefit to each party, expanding our understanding of current gaps and the necessary skills to improve critical infrastructure protection, even suggesting the direction that municipal governments must take to defend themselves and work with our Army. It is a model of partnership benefiting the Army, and I believe we're going to hear several examples of innovation from our panelists. When General Milley spoke at SciCon US, a gathering of cyber professionals across the military, industry, and academic communities, the Chief of Staff focused much of his remarks on cadets and company-grade officers in the audience. Regardless of their service and career path, these leaders need to understand how to conduct operations across all five domains. That rock is in their rucksack, he said. It is not just the cyber officers who will need to understand the cyber domain. All Army officers will be leading in multi-domain competition and conflict. The Army Cyber Institute has developed and implemented the Cyber Leader Development Program, researching pre-commissioning training and curriculum for our West Point and ROTC cadets. This program encompasses both West Point and ROTC with an added focus at our senior military colleges, where we're able to reach all the services and ensure cyber is incurred as a part of the pre-commissioning education. It is a multidisciplinary effort. We cannot separate the math and engineering students exploring cyberspace in their labs from the strategic, legal, and ethical discussions social science students debate in their seminar rooms. We need work across disciplines to ensure each student leverages the diversity offered at their colleges and universities. As a part of the Cyber Leader Development Program, we've run a summer incubator at West Point for ROTC students. Cadets from across the country and various disciplines immerse themselves in multidisciplinary cyber research under the supervision of the researchers of the Army Cyber Institute. So I've discussed two successes, and some of their underlying issues and complexities will be the threads upon which we can weave today's discussion on partnership, innovation, research, education, workforce development policies, and authorities. So I'd like to welcome our moderator, Lieutenant General Retired J.D. Johnson, and our panelists to join me as we explore partnerships. Thank you, Colonel Hall, and uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks to AUSA for sponsoring this panel and sponsoring today as we get the chance to talk about uh, this important topic area. Our panel to discussion today is the Army's academic and partnership outreach efforts to support the cyberspace fight. And before I begin, while you've got their bios, I want to do a short introduction of those who are uh, on this uh, panel today, because these uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think, have got a lot of important things to say about, about partnering, and we'll in specifically focus on where we've already achieved some successes and best practices. Uh, so you've already heard from Colonel Andy Hall, who's the director of the Army uh, Cyber Institute. Uh, to my right is Colonel Robert Keeley, the head of systems engineering department at West Point. We've got Ms. Ms. Uh, Natasha Cohn as the director of cyber policy and client strategy at Blue Voyant. We've got Mr. Tyson Meadows uh, come to us from the National Security Council, where he is a White House director for cybersecurity policy. We've got Dr. Daniel Rags Ragdale, uh, who is a professor of practice at Texas A&M and is the director of cybersecurity initiative for the Texas A&M uh, uh, experiment. And uh, with that, 
uh, a little break uh, from the normal practice of uh, five minutes each. We, we uh, through our preparations, have come up with some questions we think that would best stimulate discussion amongst the group, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions from, from the audience. So let's start with education. Colonel Hall mentioned the success that ACI has built with the Cyber Leader Development Program, both with West Point and ROTC cadets. As we look at attracting talent to the Army and our pre-commissioning programs, I'd like to hear from each of you on what you've seen work and some of the ideas uh, that you're working on. And Andy, we can start with you and pass it down the line. Yes, sir. Well, one of the, the great models that we have at, uh, at West Point is that we get a chance to send our young officers back to, to graduate schooling, and then they come back to West Point. And that, that unique mixture of uh, the diversity that we that we get from studying at the schools across the country and then bringing that talent back to, to West Point really uh, creates a, an ecosystem where the, 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 the education just uh, takes off at West Point. And we understand that the, the density of uh, cyber experts and, and graduate school opportunities we have at West Point don't exist everywhere else across the, the Army, especially uh, most ROTC programs are only going to be able to have the luxury of a couple uh, junior grade officers. And so one of the things that we've tried to do at, at West Point is provide the, the mentorship to, across the community so that we have uh, mentors that are available for the ROTC cadets across the country to reach out and have uh, cyber officers that can answer some of their questions by having the, the density that we have at West Point really work across the, the entire ROTC. I think so when we talk about ROTC rags, if you would address what's going on at A&M and how that partnership is working there. Yeah, sure will. Um, let's see, is that on? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, first of all, thanks. thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Um, we are in, uh, as we all know, very interesting times. And we're very fortunate, frankly, uh, I, I happen to be at a, a large university that has a uh, significant uh, ROTC program actually the largest uniform uh, corps outside of the academies in the country. And we're very fortunate that what has transpired at uh, West Point <clears throat> and actually the other academies, we're able to build upon. So the cyber leader development program that uh, was, was conceived and developed at uh, West Point in con uh, working in, in conjunction with the uh, Army Cyber Command is a program that focuses not just on courses because courses have to be the fundamental you know, uh, foundational block for helping people develop the knowledge and skills they need. But the program is actually goes well beyond the classroom. It looks at experiences that will help, in their case, the cadets at the academies, but now at, at senior military colleges and ROTC programs and actually in all ROTC programs, to have experiences outside of the classroom that complement what they get in the classroom, whether they be internships, whether they be participation in cybersecurity extracurricular activities, whether they be participation in uh, cybersecurity competitions, which is an uh, increasingly important way to identify talent in this space, whether it be attending events like this here or those, uh, for example, like DEF CON. So it's a comprehensive program that, that is uh, really uh, thousands of hours of experiences that at the academies and ultimately at places like uh, Texas A&M uh, where they have a chance to learn the learn what they need to learn so they're job ready when they get to these in the case of uh, those that are going to be commissioned officers when they get to their um, their uh, bullet uh, situations or uh, whatever the other services have for their young officers they're ready and they uh, are going to be able to rapidly acquire the specific skills they need to serve in uniform. For those that don't uh, take a commission, and about half, for example, the 2,500 men and women that make up the Corps Cadets today, and about half of them don't take a commission. So that, but they, they have a, a acquired knowledge and skills that they can contribute to in the, uh, in the federal, state, local, or for that matter, in uh, other nonprofits, and for that and, and, and certainly in the private sector. So it's a, it's a program that we believe is going to uh, help address the really critical and more pressing needs, and it gives us cause for hope. So there's a lot of people that believe that we're losing ground. We, we learned, uh, we've, we've heard over and over that cyber is not just uh, technologies and capabilities, it's a people dimension. And we will have, a, we currently have, we'll have an even more formidable workforce in uniform and out of uniform in the public sector and in the private sector by virtue of what's transpiring now in uh, institutions of higher education. 
Thanks. And uh, Colonel Keeley, you talked a little bit about uh, how uh, attracting cyber and uh, uh, workforce and working on leader development affects you and your department. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks so much. And, and it's really exciting for me to be able to represent West Point when AUSA hosts a, you know, a hot topic, something that's relevant to the Army, uh, you know, including us uh, as an educational institution and, and doing that leader development with our future officers. But looking at, you know, the current fight and, and how we can get integrated, it's a it's a great honor. Uh, and um, I'm in a, I'm a head of a systems engineering department, so so not a cyber expert, but I want to kind of speak for from an interdisciplinary perspective, because I think we recognize uh, the interdisciplinary nature of cyber and many of the, the Army's challenges, and also that, that critical uh, a idea of the operational integration of the research ideas. Uh, there, there can be the greatest uh, solution to a problem, but without all the integration that needs to occur, uh, that, that integration may not be uh, achieved uh, at, the, at, the, at the point where it's needed. Um, and so in our uh, research program in the department, uh, we've been able to be uh, pretty successful in doing uh, some of some of this reimbursable research uh, for Army organizations to look at uh, various topics, and certainly cyber is one of them. We've had some success for a systems engineer. One of the integration ideas of cyber is, you know, storage of your data, getting your data, analyzing your data, so then that gets presented to the, the cyber uh, community, uh, you know, and they can start to make decisions on that. And we've had uh, faculty and cadets participate in that effort. And, I wanna, and I'm working with uh, one of Colonel Hall's uh, researchers uh, in our department on the area of uh, cyber kinetic uh, integration. So there's these cyber exploits and cyber defeat types of things you can do. And we're using modeling and simulation to try to understand what the operational impact would be of some of these uh, cyber technologies and also the limitations uh, that they would bring as we integrate uh, on the battlefield. What that does for our cadets is, is it really uh, reinforces uh, their understanding of the value of their education and the value of the skills that they're learning. Um, and there's this weird, uh, it's, you know, many of you are probably parents, and so you tell your kids something, and of course, they, they don't believe you. And uh, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a relationship like that between teachers and students. We tell them stuff, and they're like, oh, you know, you're just telling us because you want us to do well on the test. And so when we can bring in people that have these real problems, these real challenges, and the students can recognize it, that, you know, oh, wow, somebody actually uses this stuff. Uh, there's, a, there's a great synergy, and I think it builds a, um, a, a bit of a, a fire for the discipline uh, that can sometimes be hard to, to get in an academic setting where, you know, exams are next week and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've reached out and, and worked with the community on a reimbursable research program. Uh, there are mechanisms to do that with cadets. Uh, there are mechanisms to do that with faculty research. Uh, and we also have uh, a few centers at West Point uh, that, that kind of dive <coughs> deep into these, into these problems. And so, um, you know, this partnership, it's great to, to be on this panel and, and kind of have this discussion because uh, this partnership is a, it's truly a win-win for everybody. The, um, the students are the greatest winners because they get inspired about their discipline. Uh, uh, we as a department uh, benefit because it, it enriches our understanding of our own domain. And then the folks we're working with, uh, we do our best to try and provide some contribution to them as well. And so everybody grows. And so thanks for that. Okay, great. And so related to education is workforce development. And so I'm going to start off here by apologizing for not introducing one of the key uh, members we have on the panel here, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Tim Blackle, who is the Director of Cybersecurity Business Quantum Research International and CyberDX. And so who better uh, to talk about workforce development than, than an industry partner? So sorry about that, Tim, please. I, I want to, if I could, just take a step back to the, the last question. I wanted to point out uh, one of the great successes, I think, and this goes back to the early part of the last decade when Dan and uh, Major Ron Dodge at the time were involved in the Service Academy cyber competitions, which expanded over time to include other universities. In my opinion, probably one of the most important aspects of, of this effort is to get people on keyboards doing operations. It's one thing to have classroom training and discussion, to talk about theory, uh, doctrine, and those kinds of things, but the actual 
physical operational concepts need to be tested, tried. People get excited by that. And it goes well beyond just the, the officer training. It's enlisted and in industry training as well because this is a unique problem set that we face. Everybody experiences the cyber threat problem. Everybody. It's not just unique to the military. And we need train and ready workforce across the military organizations. We need them across government. And we need them across all the different industries in the country because everybody's under attack. So that operational experience, I think, is very important. And one thing I've learned is that our Army and their service uh, components, uh, the experience gained by those people in the operations, the cyber defense operations, contribute significantly outside the Army and outside the services when they eventually, at some point, leave the uniformed service and go into industry or go into government. And I think uh, that training ground that we provide in a real operational uh, environment is critical. Thanks, Tim. Um, Ms. Cohen, your thoughts on workforce development and or addressing the, anything that, uh, that we didn't get to in the first question. Thank you. So, you know, I think a, a key concept here is the ability to build trust and build relationships. And that can only happen through repeated exposure and the actual practice of different people from different parts of this industry coming together and running through scenarios again and again, whether that's professional outlets, whether that's uh, students, whether that's at the high school level, whether that's at the university level. And there's two programs in particular that I want to highlight here at the student level and, and when we're talking about workforce development. And I think, you know, start off, do it early, do it often. And the first is the Cyber Patriot program in Texas. And that really gives students, both JROTC students and students outside of JROTC, Civil Air Patrol, or just in, in high schools in Texas, the ability to have a cyber competition at that level. And there's a, a large academic uh, training program at the high school level in Texas, but this gives them the ability to really work it out at an operational level. And this, in one instance, actually, the 70, uh, 780th Military Intelligence Brigade in Texas sponsored a team uh, to go to the, the competition free of charge and worked with the students and actually got the exposure uh, to the active military. And I, I think that kind of experience is really key for students at the high school level to experience what they could be doing later in life. And the second is the Cyber 912 Policy Challenge, because there's a, a lot of competitions or exercises that happen, as you said, hands on keyboards. But it's also important to look at it at the policy level. And that gives the students the experience, both at the undergraduate and graduate program. Actually, West Point has sent a team numerous times. Uh, they won last year and against teams at the graduate level. And they, they have to work through what are the policy challenges. It's a competitive scenario where there's a, some kind of cyber attack that continues to evolve and get more and more serious. And they have to work through what are the issues. They're, they're responding to an attack, presenting policy you know, to the National Security Council, so to speak. And it gives them the opportunity not only to interact with other students, but also for the judges to interact. And they come from both military and civilian life. And again, build those relationships, start talking to each other, and how to respond to incidents, how to work through these issues together. Thank you. So uh, as was discussed, you know, a key part of national security is, is being able to build this workforce and be able to make sure that uh, through partnerships and, and other means that they're trained. I'd ask uh, Mr. Meadows if you'd talk a little bit about this from the perspective of the National Security Council. Absolutely. So uh, back in May, the president signed his uh, cybersecurity executive order. And in that, we, uh, he recognized that um, the cyber workforce issue is a national security challenge. It's not just uh, an employment challenge or an economic challenge. It's a national security challenge. Um, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education tracks our numbers pretty closely. We're short about 300,000 cybersecurity professionals in the United States. Uh, it's not to say other countries aren't short as well, but we don't see this number closing. Regardless of what we do right now uh, in higher ed, it's just there's so many fundamental gaps. The, the, the need is going to grow so much faster than the supply. Um, so what we have to recognize here is we need an unfair advantage. If we're going to be 300,000 people short, the people that we do have have to have I think at a minimum, home field advantage. And what we're finding is that um, while I think the DOD, the Department of Army, Navy, et cetera, have done a really good job you know, kind of solidifying that defense of the Doden, the adversaries aren't going to the Doden. Most of our critical infrastructure in the United States, the cyber aspect, aspects of it especially, um, it's all private sector owned. So these public-private partnerships are the only way we're going to get to this home field advantage. So 
what, what does that mean? I think, I think we're starting to see this happen in a couple of different places, some decent models. Um, in the non-academic realm, the, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence up in Rockville um, is basically they have these labs where the private sector will bring in a technology, a piece of kit, you know, a new network uh, type of infrastructure, and they'll, they'll work on hardening it, figuring out what the best practices are. Um, unfortunately for uh, the military side, almost all the folks that are working on this right now are either MITRE engineers or interns, no uniform folks. Um, what I have seen, however, at, say, for example, the Naval Postgraduate School, um, they've been bringing in maritime technologies from the vendors and starting to work on those in the labs and to a sort, sort of a similar ends. If they find any vulnerabilities, they pass them back. But since it's Naval students or civilians who are working for the Navy looking at that to technology, they're becoming familiar with that technological terrain that they're going to be asked to operate on. Uh, one of the unfair things we're going to ask of the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy, and the Marine Corps is in a, in a, in a major cyber challenge that affects uh, at the national security scale, it's almost certainly going to happen on civilian infrastructure. And unless they go into that infrastructure with some degree of familiarity of what it was like before it was attacked, they're going to be at a major disadvantage. And so I think what we have to do is create more opportunities for this. It's not just about numbers. It's about their familiarity with the, the operators knowing what good looks like, knowing how to get back to it, knowing how to fight back to it. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I, I think the, the trends we're seeing now, um, we're going to expect our uniform services to somehow respond to a national security crisis on critical infrastructure at some point in the future, um, and they're going to have to be ready to go because we're just not going to have a, you know, a six-month training cycle to spend them up on it. So it's that public-private partnership, whether it's in an academic environment, whether it's in something like the NCCOE, that we're, that's going to kind of bridge that gap, and we definitely need more of that. It's, a, it's certainly a major insight from the, from the cybersecurity executive order, but, but getting our arms around that problem is going to be something we, we're going to have to do as a nation just to, just to bridge this gap. Thanks very much. So when we talk about partnerships, the key has got to be that all partners who, who come to the table uh, achieve their objective through, through that relationship. So Colonel Hall earlier talked about Jack Tech and what they were able to do, where West Point not only achieved its academic objectives, but the other partners were able to achieve uh, their objectives as well. So as we talk about innovation and partnerships, how have we seen partnerships create synergy and enable organizations? And I'd ask Colonel Hall to speak briefly about uh, Jack Voltaic again and, and what in that process allowed everyone to mutually achieve their So as we were working on that particular, um, on, on Jack Voltaic, we had a, a partner who was at the beginning just interested in uh, exploring what partnerships meant, but then we started to see what the, uh, what the two could bring to the table. And we were able to get the municipal government to come together and to come up to West Point and have a nice place for, um, to get away and, and to plan, but then uh, our partner had a, a simulation center with that they were able to then host the actual event. So uh, we were able to, to uh, get the, the planning and the understanding of how you create an event or how you would create an exercise that was resident at West Point, and then to, to have our, our partner be able to provide a, uh, a robust simulations uh, facility where they do uh, financial simulations across the, uh, the entire globe and take a look at how we could use those resources uh, for cyber. And then the, the, the others that gained uh, a critical advantage were the, NY, the NYPD and the, the fire department and the port authority who really the, the two main partners then facilitated the municipal government being able to help. So part of this is, is bringing resources to the table. Uh, Mr. Blackwell, I wonder if you'd talk about uh, how you all have uh, approached partnerships and benefited from them and how resources play in that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the key challenges that any industry or any company faces is having the time available to spend on this given the different tasks and customers are supporting. I think, uh, on the one hand, from a partnership perspective, picking the right partners for the right tasks and working closely together to take the best practices from each company to apply to the problem I think is important. I think uh, it was mentioned earlier, apprenticeships I think are important. Uh, when feasible, we, you know, when time allows, bringing in students to participate in some of your activities, taking that risk if you will, 
uh, as long as it's well controlled because in the cyber defense business, you know, customers are very, very concerned about the security of their networks and whoever touches those networks. But uh, I think those kinds of apprenticeships are, are important. I also think, uh, if I could, kind of do a flashback, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but the international aspect of this problem. Um, I remember back when we first stood up the International Cybersecurity Program, unfortunately I was the guy that had the mission to do that, and there was a lot of tea drinking and coffee drinking and uh, discussions with allies and foreign partners to try to pull that together, and it took several years just to get the basic operational procedures in place to be able to share information, let alone to get the information sharing required. But it paid off down the road. As an example, uh, when you look at NATO, NATO today has a center of excellence that took almost a decade to pull together. Uh, when I was leading the Microsoft defense business a while back, we actually had all these international partners together at the headquarters for a conference, and it was during that conference that Estonia was attacked back in 2007. And all the participants came together to help. So partnerships are extremely important, but they're difficult to maintain, I think. I think it's very important to establish clear objectives, um, what each particular partner wants to gain from that partnership and stay focused on that because it's easy to just drift off, have a partnership and then it dissolves over time because of a lack of effort or a clarity of mission. I think that's really a key point that, 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 and the whole point of this question is, you know, how to maintain synergy. So how, how do you maintain those partnerships and pull them together? Dr. Ragsdale, if you could talk from your perspective about what's worked in uh, not only uh, creating a partnership, but in, in, in pulling that together and maintaining synergy and, and having uh, lasting capabilities. Sure. Turn this on, pardon me. Uh, if I could, I'd like to address the, uh, the, you brought up trust. And I think trust is really the critical element here. If, the, if we're gonna be successful in partnering, we need, to, we need to exercise. We need to have not just plans on a shelf, we all know this, those, have, you know, those that have been to uniform, you have a plan on the shelf. If it's not exercised, if it's not trained, it's not gonna be successful. So we need to, I, I love Jack Voltaic and similar exercises that have partners collaborating on a, in, a, in a, uh, a fictitious scenario, but one that is, that is close to reality and, and has the interaction that takes place or would take place in the event of a real incident. So there's, an, it is trust at its, at its core is, is personality driven. If you know who's on the other end of the phone, you know the team lead who's gonna arrive at your scene, at your site rather, um, trust will be built up. So I think there's a, uh, there's a lot to be said for, um, for uh, exercises that go beyond just the tabletop. Tabletop is crucial and I love Cyber 912. We had a team that qualify for the semifinals and and it and it underscores the importance of innovation and the policy side but you have to exercise this at not just the tabletop level but at the uh, technical at the um, technical level in terms of uh, where there's been some great successes that we're seeing from a higher education perspective there's a variety of programs that have us uh, in higher education engaged with uh, uh, federal agencies, in particular the uh, National uh, Security Agency, they have a Center of Academic Excellence program. There's now over 200 schools that, that it's effectively, if you get one of these designations, and there's three of them, it's effectively a mini accreditation that says that what you're doing with your students is, is helping them acquire the knowledge, skills, abilities that will help them assume and be uh, jobs in the cybersecurity profession where they're, they're ready on uh, day one. There's, there's a designation for uh, cyber defense research, one for cyber defense education, and a very important one for uh, cyber operations. So <clears throat> for those of you that are looking to partner, uh, schools that are in that community, and, and I will tell you it's a very small group that has all three, there's probably seven across the country, and there, as it turns out, happens to be one, one public school and the uh, major research institution that happens to be Texas A&M that has all three. Just a little uh, paid, paid political announcement there, okay. There's also a very, very important program run out of uh, the National Science Foundation called Scholarship for Service. This program was way ahead of its time. It was first conceived in the late 90s. It, uh, the first, basically, it's kind of like an ROTC scholarship. 
you, you, you get uh, tuition fees, books, and as it turns out, a very generous stipend of $23,000 a year to a student. Every year in the program, they have to pay back to the federal, state, tribal, or local governments that service. It's really a wonderful program to uh, acquire talent, and it's been tremendously successful. Way ahead of its time, the first cohort that came out, there were no jobs for about one third of them. They had to release them from the program. Now, when you go to the job fair, and we'll be we'll be pleased. A and M just joined this community uh, in early January. It's kind of like the New York Stock Exchange. There's so much uh, so much uh, demand for for the students that come out of the program. Uh, there's also a, a, a DOD uh, cybersecurity uh, scholarship program. Uh, those schools that are in those mix, and what I'm doing is, if you if you look at those schools that are in those populations, you're more likely going to find schools that are going to be amenable to collaborating, to working with, to uh, <clears throat> to not only just uh, listen to you in terms of what the students need to learn and the skills they need to have, but also I haven't talked much about research, but there is true innovation that comes out of higher, United States higher education. That is why we continue to be the most respected uh, education program across the globe. It's because students from around the world come to our doors and they learn how to innovate, they learn how to develop, they learn how to uh, think creatively in this space and bring about uh, real innovation. Uh, one other, or, or actually two other things I want to highlight, uh, National Science Foundation also has a, um, uh, uh, a uh, program for industry, I got to get this right, it's IUCRC, that's how I think it is. So it's industry, university, collaborative research centers. There's about 70 or so of them. There's about, oh, I would say about a dozen or so that focus on cyber issues. Um, this is an opportunity for, for companies to engage with universities and get access to the great talent and the scholars that are in among the uh, the professors that are that are at those institutions, but most importantly, to begin a relationship with some of those students that would be doing the research. Um, I want to highlight one other thing that because this you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned the importance of there's an international flavor here. A number of these programs require the students to be U.S. citizens. So there, is an, uh, there are those that would like to tap into that specific population. And by virtue of looking at those schools and those programs that are, that are in those communities, you'll be likely to have access to a, uh, a pipeline, if you will, knowing that it's not as big as it needs to be. We need to make the tent bigger, but a uh, pipeline of those that have uh, U.S. citizenship. Thanks. You know, we're talking about the uh, practical aspects of how through partnership to achieve synergy and to enable organizations. I'd ask uh, Colonel Keeley if he would talk a little bit about his own experience about how better to enable organizations that want to work with the U.S. government. Yeah, thanks, sir. Uh, what I'd like to address is uh, a, a mechanism that allows uh, DOD educational institutions to work with industry, and that's a cooperative research and development agreement. Uh, where um, you know what really is going on is that both the industry partner and the educational institution and, and the government are interested in a particular technology and there's a synergy that occurs when the industry partner kind of brings in their technical and development expertise on, around a concept that, that properly has an operational focus and then you can have students provide their academic sort of uh, you get an open-ended sort of uh, free look at how you might be able to innovate with it, and the students and faculty are able to bring that. But you're also, um, because you know, we're you can also kind of look at how do you operationalize that that uh, technology. Uh, we've had a, a 10 year uh, long cooperative research and development agreement in my organization uh, with Lockheed Martin, and we've looked at missile defense technologies, uh, fallout from uh, missile attacks, uh, um, you know, laser. And we're teeing up uh, a cyber uh, look for next year. Uh, and the, the key to success, the trust, I'm glad kind of Dan talked about that trust. Um, you know, we've worked with them long enough that, that we understand, you know, what their equities are and how to meet them. They understand what ours are and how to do that. But that's been a, a very mutually beneficial agreement. And I see there are certainly a lot of uh, industry folks here today. Uh, and that's a, a mechanism that allows that level of cooperation that, that it does achieve those synergies. Um, no discussion of innovation would be complete without looking at policies and authorities, and we've got several people here that can address this, both from the standpoint of being 
and somehow inhibited or, or limited because of existing policies or authorities or those that are working in those venues right now. So as we talk about preparing for and preventing fu future cyber conflict, there's a lot of agreement that we need public-private work by the right experts on critical topics to facilitate future success. So the question is, what ideas do you have to better enable and by enable uh, discussing uh, policies and authorities, this cooperation between uh, public and private entities. And I, I'd like to talk with, uh, uh, start with Mr. Metters on that, please. So I think uh, one thing we're looking at, I think is the National Exercise Program, uh, something that's managed uh, from the White House, but we, we need to see more um, right of bang exercising. So what I mean by this is, you know, typical we'll do TTXs post attack, but what we need to do is bring in the private sector far more proactively and talk through, okay, your services are down, what are your priorities? Where do you want us to send, you know, where, do you, where, does, where does IDCS cert need to go first? Um, if it's 30 sites, how do we work with the sector specific agencies? You know, for example, Department of Energy uh, works with the electrical power sector. Are they gonna provide that prior prioritized list? Um, and then once we have that list, you know, how are we doing the logistics to get the teams to the 35 sites around the uh, country that they need to go? Um, and how can we do that within hours? Because that's gonna be the demand signal when you lose something like electrical power. Um, you know, there are certain processes right now that we use for cyber that weren't built for cyber. So the defense support for civil authorities, for example, was really there to, to be exercised or be utilized for national, or natural disasters. Uh, the action times there, you know, days are okay. Uh, but with cyber attacks, they're gonna be far more systemic. They're gonna, we're gonna lose all sorts of services all at once, possibly over geographically dispersed area. We have to be able to do that probably in hours. Uh, so that's kind of a policy tweak. I think the other aspect about this is whether it's DHS, whether it's the FBI, whether it's the DOD, um, one of the skill sets our teams, regardless of what their normal day-to-day -day role is, that they're going to have to have is how to integrate sort of in this combined team environment. When you're working with the engineers, with the IT experts at the, at the company, at the critical infrastructure entity that is running that piece of critical infrastructure, how do you integrate with them? There's a teamwork element there that our folks really, really have to be good at. It's not a policy question as, as much as I think is a training, education, and expectation thing. You're going to have to go in there, work synergistically with those private sector partners, not try to throw your weight around as a, as, a, as a Fed, but be a cooperative partner because ultimately we're going to have to understand the nuance of a sector that our teams are gonna be unfamiliar with. So that has to be part of the exercise too. And why I think one of the aspects of going down the technology is so important, the tabletops don't usually bring this in, which is usually private sector has the expertise in the technology. So we have to be able to allow for a little bit of on the fly learning between the government teams and the private sector um, folks who own that critical infrastructure and get that to be part of that process. And without the technical questions in front of the teams, in front of the government agencies, that typically isn't an element of a TTX, we're gonna miss that piece. And that has to be something we just basically, not necessarily as a policy, but as a matter of exercise, um, we have to make sure there are technical challenge, challenges incorporated in those and represented every single time we want, run one of these. And Ms. Cohen, you've worked both in government and industry. Your thoughts on this, please? Thank you. So I, I think one of the key elements here is integrating uh, pu both public and private entities into the actual planning process and then running exercises to work out the authorities and the experiences in advance. And there's a couple of different examples here that I, I want to draw to. And number one is in Arizona, and they, they have an organization there called ACTRA, which is actually a non nonprofit that serves as their ISAL. And ACTRA is actually written into the state's incident response program. And through ACTRA's uh, configuration and organization, they can actually sur uh, surge and they have private sector resources at little or no cost to the government if there's a, an attack on U.S. State, uh, state resources. So that's one model. And then the second is Washington State and some of what they've been doing with the National Guard. And they actually held an exercise a few years ago where the uh, public utility in Snohomish County worked out a partnership with the National Guard in the area to test, do, do, a, do a pen test on the, the public utility systems. And they actually wound up with full access to the SCADA systems. Uh, a lot of the TTPs that the National Guard used actually mirrored what the Russians did in Ukraine. But it was a two-year process to set up that just a pen test. And having had that experience now, they've been able to work out some of the authorities and also become familiar with the terrain of public utilities in the state. And so they, I think they've done a very good job of, of sending around the lessons learned within the state. I think the challenge is then how to send around those lessons learned outside the state. 
And it's a similar uh, experience in Maryland where the National Guard actually responded to an incident in Baltimore where a physical incident had actually turned into a cyber incident. And the National Guard was able to surge resources and figure out how to uh, defend against what was amounted to a DDoS attack on state and private, private sector uh, resources in Maryland. And they, they had wound up with a, a huge amount of TTPs from, and lessons learned from that experience, but then struggled to sh how to share that after the experience because the incident was over and they lost a lot of the authorities to do so. So that's some, some of the areas where, you know, we probably have to put some attention and in, in practice that and in, in work out the authorities in advance. Thank you. So we're going to switch to uh, questions from the audience. But before I do, I just any other comments from the panel on this issue of, uh, of authorities and policies? Okay, good. The, um, um, the question from the audience is, uh, can anyone can, uh, comment on Army Cyber's new partnership with the University of Georgia to develop the cyber workforce? Anybody familiar with that on the panel? Well, just to, to hit it briefly, the the uh, uh, Army Cyber Command is is working across the entire state, and and so the working with the University of Georgia in Athens is is one of the the latest ones, and they've previously been working with Georgia Tech and with Augusta University, to to gain the diversity of uh, of thought across the 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 three different institutions, and um, I know that uh, Mr. Pontius was uh, was quoted in the in the paper, and he's been very active in in working on the the, uh, the talent management and, and um, how we develop that. And, and I think that, that the key thing is to get as much diversity as they can. And so they're trying to ensure that they, they reach out to all the major institutions in Georgia, which is going to be the real home of, of Army Cyber in the future. And then we also work across the country to, to ensure that we're getting, uh, getting uh, additional uh, research from the, the Northeast and the West. Dr. Ragsdale, do you have something you want to add on that? Well, certainly there's a tremendous value to be seen there. We actually had a visit from the folks from Army Cyber uh, just the week before last, and it was uh, to build upon what they've, the relationship they have with it, with Augusta. They've got a very um, uh, very promising program in place with them and the University of Georgia, as you pointed out, and, and long-term with Georgia Tech. Uh, so they looked, at, they looked across, uh, across the country and saw there were programs uh, particularly those at uh, senior military colleges where you've got a critical mass of, of uh, talent that is going to be coming joining the, uh, the, uh, the uniform force and, and actually uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, civilians in the Department of Defense and, uh, and then federal government. So uh, see some real promise there. And what it has done is, is, it, is it has increased the level of dialogue. And that to me is uh, one of the most important parts of this because you think of higher education, you think of the purpose of higher education, to, to create new knowledge, to disseminate that knowledge. Sometimes that there is a, it is not uh, in, in, uh, congruent with our goals and objectives as a, as a federal government, as a military force. But more often than not, when that dialogue transpires, they see that there's much more overlap in terms of their goals or their motivations and objectives. And so uh, the engagement on the part of Army Cyber and others with higher education is, is really tearing down some of those barriers to some of that collaboration. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tremendous advocate of it, and uh, I think it's going to pay some real dividends. The, uh, the next question is, how can we encourage the private sector to better view itself as a key component of our national cybersecurity apparatus, not just as a profit-driven supplier of goods and services? Now, there's a, obviously an assumption buried in here about that that's the way that, that the businesses may view themselves. So I, it's really, I may be two questions here. One is, does the panel see that as a, that assumption as, as being valid, and if, if, if so, uh, how can we encourage uh, industry to better view itself as a key component? And so let me go to our industry reps first, and then I'll go across. So let me start with Ms. Cohen. Thank you. So I think the, the key here is, is we'll go back to this environment of trust and, and building relationships and aligning priorities. Because everyone at the core, especially in the private sector, does what in, is in their own interest. And I, when it comes to talking to the private sector, it's understanding that what you know, cyber is not a zero-sum game. It, what can happen to one can happen to all. And it's also about making sure that they get actionable intelligence. Um, if if they, you give them and facilitate the ability to have actionable intelligence that 
doesn't necessarily give away their own security vulnerabilities, they can actually benefit from that kind of relationship. Colonel Blackwell? Yeah, I think, I think first we need to define industry. To me, there's at least three different categories, if not more, the IT industry, the defense industry, and all others, perhaps. When I look at the IT industry, and I was a part of it for about six years, I realized that most of the companies that produce the software, the hardware, the products that they're shipping out to customers, they're really driven by profit. They're driven by trying to get the best capabilities out to the market quicker than their competitors. That has an impact on building security into those products, which causes additional problems for us down the road. So there's that, com that competition is good because we end up with all kinds of great new things like IoT, which is gonna kill us on the cyber side because there's no security built into IoT devices for the most part. On the other hand, there are some companies that get it. I know the one I work for, they were trying to build cyber in. It was an imperative, but most don't. So we have a problem there. And overcoming that is a challenge because it's market driven. People want to buy things. They want the next greatest toy, the next greatest computer or device. And uh, then it's bring your own device to work and it creates problems for everybody. On the defense industry side, I think I would differ with the the way the question was posed, I think most in the defense industry realize the importance of this area to the nation. They strive to get the best quality within the money allowed to field out there for the Army and other, uh, and other defense customers. So I think there's a lot of focus there. And I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think those players that do those kinds of roles for us eventually find their way out into other industries where they can perhaps have a positive impact on the way things happen. Now, on the commercial side, I've been dealing with commercial customers across all industries, and boy, it's a mixed bag out there. I think the power generation, telecommunications industries, banking and finance, they get it. They understand the threat, they're focused on it, <clears throat> and they're trying to build the right kinds of teams and capabilities to defeat as best they can or to re at least reduce their risk. It ranges down to nonprofits. I'm on the board of a major nonprofit, and I'll tell you, most nonprofits don't even know this is an issue. And trying to get their attention has been extremely difficult. And so when you look across that whole domain of industries, there's all kinds of problems out there. Healthcare, the most attacked industry in the United States. HIPAA compliance is focused on them, so they kind of get it. But on a day-to-day -day basis, their job is to take care of patients and they have so many devices, it's almost impossible to defend those networks. So it's, it's quite a mixed bag out there on the industry side, and to me, underpinning all of this is trying to increase knowledge of the threat. Uh, the threat is not widely known, despite all the things we see in the press, and I think more and more uh, education to citizens and industries about the threat is imperative because any one of those industries could be a weak link for us in some kind of a major attack happening in the United States. Well, so you kind of covered the spread there, the, the, the spectrum of, if you will, concern and, and application and, and how the various parts of the industry see themselves. Let me ask from a, a policy standpoint, the National Security Council, uh, Mr. Meadows, if you could talk a little bit about how it's it's viewed from the position that you're sitting in. Absolutely. Um, so this was somewhat laid out in PPD 41. So what we did, the way the government's organized right now to, to create these sort of interfaces, uh, recognizing that culturally, technologically, uh, these critical infrastructure sectors, we, we list 16 of them, um, they're kind of different from each other. They have their own unique quirks, technologically, culturally, et cetera. So what we've done, we've kind of paired a sector-specific agency. So for example, the obvious one, Department of Energy works with uh, the electrical sector. They also work with oil uh, producers and refiners. Um, Department of Transportation obviously has the airline sector, maritime transportation pieces of it, uh, pipelines. Um, 
the, the challenge here is incumbent on those sector specific agencies to create really strong connective tissue. I don't think it's a surprise, as was mentioned, that certain sectors, energy, um, uh, finance, um, they have the best interfaces with Department of Treasury and Department of Energy. Um, there's kind of a spectrum, though. So it goes from agency, and typically what we see when things are really working well is a really strong ISAC or ISAL. Uh, NERC and FERC have done a great job creating the EISAC. Uh, there's a little bit of federal money there, but ultimately it's the, the industry itself realized it has to have the ability where the government knows where to go to get the message out very, very quickly to the entire sector. Uh, it can't be sort of on a company-by-company -company basis. That's just not an effective model uh, for information sharing, whether it's in one direction or the other. So we have to see those pieces. And unfortunately, what, you know, what works for the electrical sector doesn't necessarily work for maritime transportation, doesn't necessarily work for health and human services, trying to interact with the healthcare sector with all the sort of their, 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 their multi multifaceted myriad of, of device manufacturers, hospital systems, insurers, et cetera, all of those are, by definition, critical infrastructure in some way, shape, or form, or have components thereof. Health and human services is best placed to kind of understand those nuances. We're not going to, the, the DOD is not going to understand the health sector as well as they might understand uh, the clear defense contractor, the defense industrial base for which they are the uh, sector specific agency for. And because we have those relationships, those have to be active. Um, they can't, it can't be a passive thing on behalf of the company. It can't be a passive thing on behalf of the agency. And so where we're seeing the, where, the, where the best relationships exist, they're the most active relationships, where in the past three to five years, new entities, ISALs, ISECs, et cetera, have, have been created or have been enlarged and expanded. And we're actually seeing some really, really good things. I mean, I, I can think of a number of success stories in the past year between the electric sector and the Department of Energy uh, identifying issues by corroborating data, sharing information back and forth, where otherwise the government wouldn't have wouldn't have had enough information, and the private sector wouldn't have had enough information to get that full threat picture. Um, so I'm, I, I think that, and obviously Treasury and, and and the financial sector have done an amazing job as well. And I think that's really really important. That's how we're going to get around this, uh, because I. I there's no sort of the FBI, DHS just can't understand um, as a single organization all those nuances across 16 critical infrastructure sectors, you know, tens of thousands of companies, medium, small businesses. That's just too hard to do for any one group. So I think this model we have works. Uh, I think the challenge is it has to be a very, very interactive thing. And just to go back to those th that 300,000 person gap. That's not evenly distributed across sectors and not evenly distributed inside the federal government. So, you know, one of the challenges is the, the, the workforce thing really does have an impact on the ability of the healthcare sector to interact with health and human services, who also hasn't have a full billet of cybersecurity professionals in their organization. So right now, those workforce gaps means we don't have sort of those uh, common language, those translators, if you will, uh, that can go from sector to cyber. And that's going to be another challenge we have to get our arms around. We have to have folks who are expert in both their sector and cybersecurity in order to tailor the nuances of cybersecurity at a strategic level, at an operational level, at a tactical level to those sectors. And it's a, it's a big problem. It's going to take time. But I think we have the right framework in place uh, to get our arms around that. So I saw a lot of scribbling uh, amongst the participants up here. So before we move on to the next question, which has to do with threat, let me ask if anybody's got something else to add to answering this question. Yeah, I think uh, we've kind of touched on it, the information sharing problem. One of the things that concerns me is that many commercial organizations, if you will, that are attacked hold that information inside because they're afraid of the, the risk to their business. Um, they don't want to go public. It's the risk adverse in terms of sharing information. And I think it's very important to somehow get that information shared, but an anonymously using the Interpol model. So the ISACs play in here um, to some degree. Trust plays in here. There has to be an ability for these uh, potential industry partners to realize they can share with organizations and with their colleagues and their competitors, if you will, um, but that information won't necessarily lead back to them. I think that's really important because there's a lot of attacks going on out there we never hear about. The, correct. Li liability is a, a, a huge issue. I saw a recent study uh, where, for example, in small and medium-sized businesses that had been breached or had a major ransomware attack, within six months, 50% of them are out of business. So they realize how big this risk is. and. How do you share information with those kinds of organizations? Then you add on top of that, most of them don't have cyber people. They have small IT teams. 
they don't have the money to invest in it, how can you reach out to them and, and create that possibility for them to at least have some degree of capability to defend against that risk? Um, so I think uh, industry funded also, I think, is an important point that I heard. Um, within the industries, the big players really need to step up and help take the leadership to build those kinds of organizational structures that can share information across that industry. And where there have been successes there, I think we need to emulate those. Yeah, I would just uh, add that uh, it, when it starts to become a discriminator for a, an OEM to provide that kind of support and coverage to its supply chain, I think you start covering some of these uh, smaller businesses and giving them the wherewithal that they don't otherwise or can't otherwise afford to have. We have a question from Huntsville, and I think this is a pretty central question, actually, so I want to get to it before we have to end. It says, how would you characterize differences between an advanced cyber threat to systems in the civilian sector versus systems in the military sector? And uh, I'm, I'm going to go right back to uh, Colonel Blackle here um, to kick this off and, and start walking through. They're all the same. They're absolutely all the same. I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we have uh, kind of take a look at what we can do militarily from a cyber attack perspective. Well, a lot of those same tools and capabilities are used, used by the hackers out there in the wild against anybody. So I don't think there is a differentiation. I think uh, the threat is the threat. It continues to evolve. Um, scary thing I saw recently, 600 million different types of malware right now. There's no way for the antivirus companies to keep up with that. And as the threat evolves, we're constantly trying to improve and change our defensive capabilities against it, and it applies to everybody, not just the military. In fact, I think we may be ahead in the military from all the work we've done going back to the late 90s to build defensive capabilities for the military networks, but the weakest links could be the underpinnings of our society and the different industries that will come under attack. And all one has to do is take a look at what happened to Georgia in 2008, where every single network in the country was taken down by the Russians in a period of five days. It can be done. So uh, the, the threat scares me, and we're always behind. So since that's central, any other comments by the panel about threat? Uh, let's start at the far end with Mr. Meadows. Uh, so, you know, the, the more sophisticated adversaries and even the less sophisticated adversaries typically go after the, the softest point that gives them the maximum gain. And I think, um, you know, we, we've seen, you know, it's mentioned here in this, this handout uh, about securing the Army's weapon system and supply chain from attack. Um, you know, even for the DOD, that, that typically means transcom and the contractors that support transcom. So the folks that are off Doden, uh, because the Doden's been hardening, the Doden has standards, the Doden has teams dedicated to it. Why not go after, you know, a contractor that supports? And that's where we really have, where you can't sort of bifurcate the, the military versus the civilian. I mean, this is why we call them critical infrastructure sectors, why they're designated as such, because the impact of them is a national security challenge. Um, one of the things, I think, uh, from a national defense perspective that we're getting our arms around is that, you know, for most of this country's uh, history, we've had the, the benefit of two very large oceans between us and most adversaries. In cyber, that doesn't matter. There is no space. You know, the, the least capable actor who can't get a boat across a lake can cyber attack a critical infrastructure from any place in the world. And that difference now means that they're finding, you can go on Shodan, you can find weaknesses in critical infrastructure in the United States with a quick search. Um, that means anybody can attack it now. And I think that that aspect is kind of key because, you know, you could, with a little bit of research, get to the conclusions to ha that have national security impacts, but you don't go after you don't go after the gray ship if you're a pirate. You go after the merchant ship, and that's that's kind of where we're at today. The the, the bad guys are going after those those weak, soft underbellies, those medium, small sized businesses. You know, you don't go after the biggest banks. You go after the smaller banks, and this is what we're learning. This is where the adversaries uh, are going, whether the nation states are less than that, and that's sort of why we can't bifurcate anymore. Dr. Ragsdale. Yes, absolutely. I think this uh, gets really to the to one of the core issues. We're hearing a lot about how uh, great the Department of Defense has been, and and actually, it's a, it is a great success story. There's, it is it is obvious that our our military networks are defended better than others. So we have to ask the question: Why is it because we have better technologies and better capabilities, in part? But actually, I think it's more of the human dimension side of this that it is policy and practice. 
that have made our Department of Defense networks more secure. So the message to all others, if you want to emulate what's going on in the Department of Defense, and I, I, I strongly recommend that, that other organizations do so, look at policies and practices and look at that, in, that it was a leadership issue. The, the Department of Defense leadership made some hard decisions. I mean, simple things like no USB drives going back to 2008. That has helped to make our networks more secure. And if you go outside of DOD, you see a lot of USB drives. I, I have one in my bag, and I use it all the time. We need to, ex it needs, it's a leadership issue. The leaders need to make it clear that there are, there are policies and practices that need to be put in place, and that in and of itself, even with no infusion of new technologies or capabilities, will make our networks more secure. We need to accept some inconvenience in the same way when we walk up to our homes each night and we put a key in the door, it's a little bit inconvenient, but it's a matter of our practice. Two-factor authentications, you know, the, the, you gotta have your cell phone, it's a little inconvenient, but I'm telling you, you get a substantial measure of enhanced security. So I think really ultimately it comes down to the thing that's going to make the difference. We're gonna have the, the best trained uh, workforce, we're gonna have the most exceptional technologies and capability, but I think if we have if we combine that with the right practices and policies, we're going to have that much more security. Yeah, Dan, and I would add one more P in there, and that's the purse, funding. Um, DOD's had the funding. Most businesses out there don't. This is a C-level issue now, and they need to understand that they're going to have to carve out a piece of their budget in order to defend the networks that they depend on. If they don't do that, yeah. it's very difficult to get the mission accomplished. Uh, so that's an important point. Ms. Cohen, can you talk a little bit about as you advise your clients and, and you, they address this issue of a lack of funding or, 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 um, uh, or encouragement to fund these kinds of capabilities, how, how you advise them? Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that we talk about to our clients all the time, and, and it goes back to this issue that we've been talking about, about education and making sure that people are aware of the kind of threats that they're, they're looking at. And I look at two key trends here, and the, and the first is the widening of the attack surface. And you mentioned Shodan and, and the ability to, to do a public scan without even having any tools. The second, though, is the, intersect, is, uh, the ability for criminals or hackers uh, in general to buy ready-made tools on the dark web or, or not even on the dark web, just parts of the internet. And so the skill level required to exercise an attack has actually dropped. And the, the second theme here is the intersection, when it comes to the, the applicability towards the military, the government, is the intersection of criminal elements and non-state actor, and, and state actors, and how information flows between one and the other. And so, yes, yeah, in the private sector, it's, it's probably a, a criminal element that is the most uh, a threat. But when you're talking about connection to, to the DOD or to the government, that, that threat expands into the state actors that may, in fact, work through or with criminal elements. And so when we talk to our, our clients and how to manage you know, shortfalls in budget or lack of resources, I think one of the, the other key trends that we're seeing here is the, the use of consolidated or outsourced cybersecurity resources because it's only a, a larger institution that's really gonna have the ability to put enough people to monitor the systems, to monitor the threats, and to actually look at various sources of data and make sure that they, they correlate all of that. And so that's something that we see in the private sector and in the public sector. You know, some, some states actually are, are wielding their own SOC and their own consolidated cybersecurity at the state level and extending those resources to local, local communities. And, and that's a really interesting model that, that we're following very closely that already industry is, is ahead of, and, and we're seeing that expand. So just continuing on this uh, theme of funding, because I think it, it, it is an issue for everyone. The question is, uh, could the panel address how resourcing to support cyber competitions is being done? So uh, Colonel Keeley talked about CRATAs. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Not with respect to cyber competitions, uh, in addition to what I've already said. Okay. Well, the, some of the, the, the great competitions that were funded, supported by NSA, and then um, the, the DARPA challenges that, that have been set up to, to do uh, our competitions have now been, uh, been taken over by the Army, and, and we have a... Uh, all Army cyber stakes that we run that, that kind of takes the lessons learned, initial funding by DARPA and now uh, funding by the government, but then also kind of that 
the, the how-to block that came out of the DARPA research then is, is available for uh, the, the, the institutions across the country to do local competitions as well as to do the, 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 the federal competitions. We talked a little bit about uh, the Cyber Patriot working at the, the uh, middle school, high school level. We really have a lot of resources now that have been created that give examples of how you could do it so that uh, the funding can be distributed because it, it needs to be a distributed funding of these kinds of competitions. If I could, if I could weigh in on that because it's been a uh, cyber competitions have been a central focus of my professional life going back to uh, 1999. I had the good benefit to uh, participate in a life changing cyber exercise uh, in the in the late 90s. And it, it convinced me there's probably no more interesting or fascinating topic out there, that it is this grand intellectual battlefield, frankly. And cyber competitions light fires. There is absolutely no question that a young men and young women in particular that have the opportunity to compete safely in a cyber competition, many of them will want to devote the rest of their their uh, personal and professional lives to that undertaking. So cyber patriot, so cyber defense exercise begat the, the collegiate cyber defense competition by virtue of an NSF grant. So we created the cyber defense competition, or cyber defense exercise at West Point. It became the cyber defense, comp, uh, the collegiate cyber defense competition, which is now close to th 300 schools nationally are involved. That begat cyber patriot. So there's a, there's a chain here. Those are defensively oriented, but what I want to highlight is over time we have become more comfortable, and I think we should, should be more comfortable with students, particularly at the collegiate level, is uh, using offensive tools and capabilities. Now that may cause people to be concerned, but I think we make a very effective argument to these young men and women to not turn to the dark side. That there are so many benefits that come to them by virtue of devoting their, the skills and knowledge they acquire in our programs and, and, and uh, to contributing to defending and protecting these large-scale interconnected systems. That there's both a, there's both a ethical issue that we could bring out, there's a legal issue we can bring out, but ultimately there's a practical issue. And this is what, you put those three together, the practical issue is they will have a rewarding, fulfilling, uh, financially rewarding profession because this is not going to go away and they 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 hear that they know they learn that particularly young people that want to make a difference want to make a positive difference and contribute this is an area where they can where they can focus their efforts so competitions are crucially important uh, fortunately many of them are uh, are privately funded or they're uh, they're in they're in the they're um, that, that don't require uh, large infusions of, uh, of either federal or state dollars. Uh, I focused on the cyber defense aspect of this. There's a number of capture the flag competitions that do have an offensive element to them, frankly, but I think it's in the it's an understanding how those offensive capabilities are, uh, how they can be brought to bear, that one learns better how uh, how to take an adversarial perspective, and it's something that we that we focus on in our educational program is that in order to build more secure systems, you have to red team them, you have to war gain them, you have to look at them as an adversary would look at them. So every design decision made throughout the full life cycle, we have to red team. We've got to say, is there a way that this decision might uh, unwittingly or wittingly advantage an adversary such that it would give them the opportunity to subvert the security of our systems? So. Big, big advocate for these for these competitions. Uh, one thing, uh, and the final point about this, and Cyber Patriot in particular, they are bending over backwards to uh, make the tent bigger. They are there is a fee associated with teams. It's a small fee, but they um, they waive the fee for all women or teams that are made up of uh, uh, all, all women or girls at the uh, in at the. Uh, at the middle school and, and, and secondary levels. So we're bringing, as it turns out, I think a full quarter to a third of the competitors now are, 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 are young ladies. Colonel Keeley? Yeah, one thing that's been going on uh, in uh, Army and DOD is a, a series of exercises that are done in the research and development community as we look at new technologies is the adaptive red team 
And that's uh, every 90 days or so, the, the red team will focus on a particular area, whether it's uh, urban UAV, border protection, uh, various vendors and technology developers will bring their technologies to these events. And then it's red teamed in a number of ways with the one in particular interest of this group would be cyber. So there is a, a DOD provided uh, cyber attack team that comes in, they, they get a van, and when you join the network for this exercise, they're gonna go after your vulnerabilities, typically not to take you down or to embarrass you in front of your potential funders, but then you get a report from that uh, joint vulnerability team that says, hey, you know, here's the vulnerabilities we found on your system. And so red teaming is a, is a very powerful way to get at uh, these technologies as they get deployed in this particular case into the DOD space, but you know, we can see the explosion of inter internet connected technologies uh, coming through the R&D chain. And many times nobody thinks about the cyber aspect of it. Uh, and so this red team is a way to, to get after it. And we have students that participate in these events. And so you, know, you, don't, you can get at it from any level. Well, that, uh, that's the time we have. I'm going to give our chair uh, last uh, words, but I would encourage all of you at the breaks. You can see the kind of expertise we have up here and the knowledge that they have. So please uh, approach the, the panel uh, members with any questions you have. Uh, Colonel Hall. Well, just in conclusion, one of the things that was brought out was the common language. And I know the, the Cyber Center of Excellence is, is working hard with Fort Leavenworth to develop that common language at the uh, – at our Command General Staff College, we've had the 780th out at the National Training Center working with our brigade commanders to try to find a way to get that common language. And then um, the ACI has been working with the War College to ensure that the War College is training uh, our, our next generation of leaders to know that common language. And I think that's, that's really important and part of what we tried to accomplish today. So thank you very much.